Please welcome to the stage, Vimal Shah, Chairman of Bidco Africa, Mohamed Duji, CEO and President of METL Group, and Mo Abudu, CEO of Ebony Life Group, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasaja. Thank you all for being here, Mo, Mohammed, and, and Vimal. We have been talking about this a lot, and I think when you think about this question of unlocking the potential of the next generation, we can take it in a few different ways, but uh, I wanted to start with the, the question itself. Where do you start with this unlocking uh, of the potential? Because the youth is there. We know the youth is there. Um, Mohammed, where, where do you start, in your opinion? So um, we all know that uh, we have a big population in Africa, I think 1.2 billion. Uh, but what I want people to understand that the GDP for Africa is 2.4 trillion. So you're talking about $2,000 plus or minus per capita. Now, if you were to take out the countries like Morocco and Algeria and Egypt out of uh, the place in South Africa, you're talking about per capita income in sub-Saharan Africa of $1,200 to $1,500 uh, uh, purchasing power. Now, with current commodity prices that have gone up, uh, if you look at edible oils with sunflower problems, rapeseed problems, palm oil problems, prices have doubled, tripled. Then fuel prices have gone up, freight has gone up, logistically it's become a nightmare, you need more working capital to hold on goods. Grain problems from Ukraine, wheat replacement values have jumped up from 300 bucks to $500. Now you're talking to people that have per capita income of $1,200 or $1,500, you're talking about $100 a month. And when prices of commodities increase and then you have taxes on top of that, uh, what happens, it squeezes the Africans. And out of that $100 that they use, 65% they use in day-to-day -day consumption. And basically, they just cannot afford to buy food. So where I feel we need to disrupt, because we have big uh, areas in terms of land and arable uh, land, that we need to disrupt by bringing in high seedlings, bring capital, uh, to the youth, that they should not migrate uh, to urban centers. And if you see in Africa, majority of, of, of millionaires, so-called dollar millionaires, are not in urban centers. They're in rural areas who are focusing on agri. So I believe the youth and the disruption has to come in in the agri sector uh, so that we can empower these youth, so that we can become the food basket of the world. Bimal, do you agree with that? I think I'd look at it from a different angle. Um, we can actually see the youth as a potential problem, time bomb, or we can see it as an opportunity. Uh, it depends on where you want to look at it from. Um, I think we've got education. We've got people now with digital awareness. I think our youth are far more capable now because they've got devices on their hands. And when they go to a classroom or they go to university, they're actually judging the lecturers based on what they're doing, fact checking on online. So I think there's a lot of potential. The question is, how do we harness this potential and really make it happen? Um, I think the aspiration of a youth in New York or in Nairobi or in Tanzania or in, say, sure, in Nigeria is the same. So there's nothing different in terms of where their aspirations are. So if you launch an Apple phone in New York, you want it in Nairobi tomorrow. Um, therefore, if I look at it from an angle, it's a level playing field with the internet. Mm. Now, with that and technology coming in, I think what we need is to get our education system up to, great, up to date. We need our leaders to listen to our youth, and really, they've got buzzing ideas. Governments already up to their necks in terms of employment, so you're not gonna get employment by government or traditional rules, and I think this is where we've gotta give them a listening, we've gotta look at it from a different angle, and again, private sector, uh, government, everybody's gotta to listen to it differently, and really, I think Africa's got the youth power that we can empower with the whole, with the whole world and really get them there, but let's change our education system, let's change our systems, including banks, and I think uh, we can talk about that, yeah. where they need to really change faster because access to capital is a big issue for youth. And then youth with a budding, really budding idea can't get access to capital. So there's a lot of issues around trust 
And I think that's where we need to really uh, build a bridge around the elder generation and, of course, the youth and the politicians. So where do you start with that bridge, Mo? Because the disconnect is there. The disconnect is certainly there, but I'd rather take a different view from, from the views that both Vimal and um, Mohammed have taken, in that I look at the fact that our youth are our biggest resource. Mm. We, are, we have the youngest population in the world. That is a resource for me. I also know that as Africans, particularly as Nigerians, I know how resilient we are. It doesn't matter what the challenges are that are before us, we always find a way to overcome those challenges. Mm -hmm. Now, during the COVID era of the last two years, many people felt that Africa would literally just disappear, right? Many famous people actually said it, that we're gonna be dropping dead on the streets of Lagos and other parts of Africa, mm -hmm. but that didn't quite happen. I'm not saying that we have all the best leaders in the world, but I am saying that despite the challenges we face, we seem to find a way to get through those challenges. Now, if I take myself as a living example of what's going on in the continent, mm -hmm. I am a black woman. I had a career in oil and gas until I was 40. When I turned 40, I decided that I wanted to change my career and get into the world of media because I knew how powerful media was in changing the narrative. Mm -hmm. When I got into this industry, I defined what's called the four Ds, and that is literally how the world has seen us. And when I say the world, the Western world, mm. disease, disaster, despair, and destruction. And that is all they see. Just Google images of Africa and see what comes up. Mm. And in order for that image to change, we have to be speaking to ourselves and saying to ourselves, what is the change that we want to see? What is the change that we want to be? Now, everybody goes to America thinking the streets of New York and LA are paved with gold, but we all know that's not the situation. But the media is such a powerful tool that we need to use to change perceptions, to change mindsets, and also as an educational tool. So for me, it's about, I've decided to play in a space that is media. We also have the Ebony Life Creative Academy that is training the next set of filmmakers. I have seen the incredible things that's happening in the world of show business. We have our artists like David O and Burner Boy selling out O2 arenas. They're empowering generations to come. Now, they have done all of this despite the challenges that we face on the continent. Mm -hmm. We've seen companies like Paystack and Flutterwave who have had huge amounts of investment in their companies from companies in America. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that, I'm not saying that we aren't challenged, but our youth are so resourceful that I just know that given half a chance, they, they are doing and they will continue to do. And yes, we do need to continue to support them, but it's not all gloom. It's not all gloom. But in order to get... <laughs> um, I think that's a, the great, a great point that you bring up, but just as Vimal was saying, yeah. it, it is different if you are sitting in New York City versus if you are sitting uh, in Lagos and, and you have a phone. So there, there still are- But they do are, have phones. They do, I mean, in both, in both cities, you, you're different. I mean, it is, there are different challenges that children in the states are facing. Absolutely, there are different challenges. I mean, on the, I mean we know what the challenges in, the, in, in New York is or what the challenges in America are. I mean, you're literally leaving your front door, you're not sure if you're gonna make it home on time. Mm -hmm. Now, do we face those challenges in, in, in Africa? No, we don't. We don't have people going around with gun violence. So we need to, I, I, you know, I keep saying to myself that we are challenged, but not, don't let's focus on the negatives. Let's build on the positives, because that's the only way that we're gonna get through all of this. We are a continent that is blessed by God with the best resources in the world that God has given to us. Value add, we must do. We can't just keep shipping everything out. Yeah. So there, is, there, there are things that we need to address and that we need to look at as a continent. And leadership is, is key. Yeah. And we talk about the fact that many of our leaders are old, but many of the leaders around the world are old. You know, so what do we say about that? Yeah. So, I mean... I mean so. Well, what role, what role do, do you guys see leaders playing? Because in, in order to give, I mean, what you were saying, Mo, building on um, the, the tools that are there already, what is it that leadership needs to be doing right now and the messages that need to be communicated to the youth? They need to yeah. lead. They need to lead and they, it's like running an organization. What does that mean though? Vimal, do you want to jump in? Team, team build. The I team. think team. leadership means looking at them and saying the potential. Because I think looking at them as up up as a problem is, is, is a problem itself. And I think that's where we need to get leadership into everything. I think uh, healthcare, ed tech, ag tech, as what Mohammed was talking about, I think there's serious potential in everything. If you look at all the issues that affect us in Africa, 
And we always say it's a basket case or whatever. It is not. It is absolutely not. And I think that's where the whole opportunity lies to say, give access to capital, get ideas flowing, and really entrepreneurship. I think there's going to be a lot of that. The leaders need to be able to listen. And I think this, this is something that's important for everybody to listen to the youth and say, fine, what do you want to do differently? And I think there's a difference in values. As a 60-year-old and a 23-year-old, there'll be a difference in the way they look at things, the way they see things. And we need to understand that. And our leaders need to understand exactly what the aspirations are, what they want to do, and then make it happen. Connect the dots. You said facilitator, not implementer. So this is another problem. There's another point. Government should never be an implementer because governments are never built for implementation. There should be facilitators to allow, allow the platform, allow the change to happen. And then we've got to go into paradigm busting because the paradigms are like, it's, we've done it 30 years ago, 50 years ago, and, and today it's different. So today they, the freedom fighters are not fighting for freedom from colonialists. They're fighting for freedom from the old paradigms. And that's where we really need to give them oxygen. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think also together with leader, good leadership, I think the private sector uh, has a great role to play. Um, so one of my initiatives is in impact investing. Mm. And if you see, for example, uh, industries that create large employments, agri, or let's say the textile industry, and everybody complains that Africa has a lot of cotton, but we just gin cotton and we export. So I have taken that challenge up and I have done the value addition. So I am ginning, I'm spinning, I'm weaving, processing, mercerizing, dyeing, knitting, printing, and I'm accessing the Agua market. Now with that, uh, they're not great returns, but I'm competitive, but most importantly, I'm giving a lot of employment. And I think with youth comes a big problem of employment. So one, there is the job factor, but two, there's the entrepreneurship factor. And coming to Vimal's point in terms of access of capital, so I have a more Devji Foundation, and I've signed the Giving Pledge. Uh, it's an initiative by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, uh, pretty much pledging half of our money for philanthropy. And I, one of the areas, talking about education, we give grants to hundreds and hundreds, and we want to get to the thousands, because a lot of kids are intelligent, are smart, but cannot access good education because of non-availability of finance or loans. There are loan boards in government, but the problem is uh, uh, they're fully utilized. So private sector needs to play a part in terms to be able to kind of help uh, and grease uh, the system. So we give uh, pretty much like grants uh, to, to, to kids to go to university, but now we have the more entrepreneurs, uh, more entrepreneurs where what we do is we give interest-free loans, mm. and uh, they come in and they pitch ideas, and, and because they don't have collateral, and because if they go to the banks and the interest rates are really, really high, and it takes forever for them to access capital. So we as private sector, I think, have a key role to play uh, in accommodating our youth to prosper. But you were mentioning that the returns are not great. And so how, how do you motivate other business leaders outside of the three of you to invest in this if you know, it's hurting their bottom line? Well, I, I think leadership has to look at the fact that they have a responsibility to do more than just returns on investment. I think that we have the youngest demographic in Africa. Most of them are allowed to vote. I mean, we have elections coming up in Nigeria now and everybody's, and their mother is saying to our youth, go and register because we have to at some point take responsibility for the leadership that we have. And if you don't have the life that you want, the only way to change that is to vote to ensure that you do get the leaders that you want. Now, we can say that Africa rigs, but if we have a population that we know the youth are more than the on youth and everybody registers, you can't, it's going to be extremely difficult to rig. So therefore, we need to ensure, we as leaders need to ensure that our youth are registered and ready to vote, mm. because that is really the starting block. We need to educate them on what it means about voting, on what it means about leadership. 
And then those that we put into power, we need to start holding them accountable. Because I find that sometimes we just don't. It's convenient for some businesses in Africa just to turn a blind eye, look the other way, get on with their business, because they don't want to upset the status quo. You know, my business is fine, I've got good relationships with the government, and that's really about it. But we do need to do a little bit more in that regard. That's a majority though, right? Well, it, it needs to happen. We need to start speaking up about the fact that we do need to have the right leaders. And then our leaders, please, for those that are listening, just select the right teams. It's like running an organization. I mean, look at us all here today. This wouldn't have happened if Bloomberg hadn't said, you know, in partnership with, you know, Qatar, we want to make this happen and this is the look and feel that we want. And the same has to apply to our government. You've got to have the right teams, the right people with the right qualifications, doing the right jobs that are going to lead us into the, into the future that we so demand and, with, and that is so, is so needed. Mohammed, jump in. I, 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 I like her thoughts. Uh, process. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so my background, I've also been a member of parliament and I was an elected member of parliament, not appointed. And uh, I have a life example like Tanzania. I mean, you look at Tanzania and we're talking about natural resources. One of the resources we have is tourism. You have the Serengeti. My brother here is from Kenya and yes. uh, they have marketed themselves far better than Tanzania. And you see the migration happening from the Serengeti into the Maasai Mara, but the Maasai Mara is only 5% of the Serengeti. But yet there are more tourists that yeah. go to Kenya than they go to <laughs> Tanzania. It's again ab about leadership and approach. You look at Sharm el Sheikh or you look at Marrakesh, they've got 12, 14 million tourists a year. And then you look at the Serengeti. So we have Serengeti, you have the Ngorongoro crater. You go into the crater, you see the big Big five, you have Kilimanjaro, you have, Sering, uh, you have Zanzibar, mm. and yet you have 1.2 million uh, tourists a year. Yeah. So obviously so there's a problem there's of leadership. A now we have a new president. She's a woman, uh, very, very vibrant. <laughs> uh, she's doing a fantastic job. She's moving around the whole world, so-called the royal tour. Mm -hmm. and, and we can already see the impact in terms of a uh, huge influx of tourists bringing foreign exchange, mm -hmm. a lot of more investment is coming into the country, and I think she's doing a fantastic job, and I think Tanzania is, is ready to fly we need with to change new, the narrative. better leadership. <laughs> we need to change the narrative. We need to change the narrative. It's really about changing the narrative. You know, do, I, think, I, think, I think we need a reset. We need a rethink and a reset here, mm. because there is a leader inside every one of us, and I think there's a leader inside every one of the youth. We just got to arouse them and give them the responsibility. So the minute you give them responsibility, that's what we're starting now in Kenya for the elections is Wajibuwango, which means take responsibility for electing your leaders yes. and really stop blaming somebody else. I think this whole blame game of let's blame it on Russia, Putin, uh, COVID or whatever, we've got to go back to say, hang on, our youth are capable. In the local areas, <coughs> they can do a lot more. Give them leadership, give them responsibility, and they can do much, lot, much more. Okay. Tourism, you talk about tourism, you talk about ag tech, you talk about drones. We've got youth who are looking at drones and stuff like that, and our governments come in and say, restrict that, don't allow this because of security or whatever. And again, some rules that are old. So I think this is where a reset and rethink required for all our youth to say, let them play with technology. I think Africa has got a lot of youth who can, very tech savvy, very, they can leapfrog yeah. to the latest, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And this is where we stop them as regulators, as even central banks. I'm sorry to say this, but central banks do not know how the banking industry needs to go. Mm. Fintech today is a disruptor, what Mohammed talked about. The disruptor is not being allowed because we think, oh, Ma, you know, we've got banks, we've got a disruption, the banking system will be gone. Kenya invented M-Pesa. M-Pesa is a one SMS and your money is transferred. Why not give it to the world and make it easy? So I think this is where the whole reset, rethink, needs to go back to everybody who's listening probably as leaders. Now, that leader inside everyone, if it's aroused, I can tell you one thing, we can say there's serious potential. We can be providers, and Africa can be a provider of the best brains to the world. I mean, our pyramids are still this way, the bottom is much bigger in the youth bulge. But I think the other places where we see in, in Europe and elsewhere, you've got that going the other way around. So we can supply that, and again, when you say work from home, work from anywhere, work from device, I think a lot of work outsourcing, stuff like that, can be done from Africa, and we have the brains. So I just think that it's about leadership saying, let's take leadership in terms of allowing them to do it, and really, give them the norms, the curbs on the road, and say, fine, this is what your norms are. Make it happen. And I think this is where it's up to every leader to say, let me create more and more followers, and really, I think we can reset the world. What about the international community? What is the role that international governments 
play in helping with this reset that you're talking about? Because yes, you can empower the youth, well, but if you're not giving them the global well, the, stage. The, we, we have allowed the international community to come into our societies and literally take everything away from us. So you put the blame on Well, yourself? it's not about, it's not, you see, again, it's about the leaders that we have. It's like, the, it's, it's about the leadership saying, what role do we play in this? I really am very passionate about value add. If we, don't, if we don't value add and we just send everything totally out, what part of that are we getting back? We're getting it back and paying 10 times the price for it that we can't even afford in the first place. Mm. So we have to look within. We have the resources. They actually need us more than we actually need them. And we need to wake up and realize that. We have the biggest deposits of everything in the world. But we have just let that just, you know, sort of fade away and it's taken away and we've signed all these agreements for years and years. We've got all this debt, you know, that somehow no one even understands where it all began or, or, or what it is. But that, that is where we are. So we have to at some point wake up and say, you know, we have the largest resources of cocoa, cobalt. Every single phone has cobalt in it. Where is the largest deposits in the world? In the Congo Republic. Mm. Where is the largest deposits of oil and gas? We have that. Diamonds and oil. I mean, what are we saying? We have it. Mm. So why don't we start holding them hostage a little bit more and <laughs> demanding more from them? It goes back to trust. It goes, it goes back to trust. I was talking to somebody in Wall Street and says, if you need a billion dollars for a project in the US or for a US entity, it's easy. If you want it for Africa, it'll take us two years to look at the trust. And I think that's where the thing is, right? A lot of foreigners come out and do things in Africa. Why are the local people doing it? Because they don't have a problem of capital formation. That's our biggest course, problem. No a lot of our leaders form their capital and is sent off to you know, safe havens elsewhere. Why can't we do that for Africa? So I think this is where we've got to get together and say, fine, let's show some credibility, let's show some action on the ground, and really lead from the front. So, so the issue, yeah. she, she, she's fantastically on point, and I'm in agreement <laughs> with her, because all these businesses that sh like cocoa beans vis-a-vis, -vis, what is the price of cocoa beans vis-a-vis, -vis, what's the price of chocolate? Chocolate. What's the price of lint cotton vis-a-vis -vis the clothing, et cetera, et cetera. So the value addition else. is tremendous. Yes. And I also agree with what, uh, what, what Vimal says. The resources are there, the problem is capital. You know, today, if you want to go in and, and, and extractive yeah. resources. You need tons and tons of money and expertise. So I'm sure we can. Well, we need to make the agreements more. For sure. They need to be fairer in terms of what those for agreements sure. look like. It's not that they get 80% and for we sure. get 20%. For sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's we what's gotta, been happening and that has to stop. More, we've got to stand up to it. I think we've got to stand up to it. It happened in, to us in Kenya, in yeah. Uganda. We did the first oil palm plantation. All the world told us it can't be done. We've done it today, it's really working. Yeah. And really, uh, it was meant to be supposing, you know, in, in West Africa or in, in Malaysia, Indonesia. We've done it. I think it's not difficult, but our people got to go into the full value addition from end to yes. end and really make that happen. Whether it's cocoa, whether it's cotton, whether it's palm oil, whether, whatever it is, 60% of the arable, unused arable land, if it's in Africa, that's the McKinsey report, right? Mm -hmm. If they're off, it could be 50%. But that's unused arable land. What are we doing with it? Food security for the world, exactly. Africa can produce it. Mm -hmm. Where are we doing it? What are we doing about it? That's leadership. That's where the youth can really play a big role. Absolutely. And using tech, using the resources, I think is absolutely possible for Africa to grow up and become the supplier. And really, last, I, we don't have any time, so I want this to be yes or no. Uh, a lot of times we've talked about this uh, Africa being the potential. It's always been the potential. Do you, do you all feel like this moment is different than well, let, let me, if really I, quick? If I could just give you time. an example. Really now, quick. I'm in the media industry, right? Um, I have partnerships all around the world with different media companies. We launched the series, by the way, please all watch, it's called Blood Sisters on Netflix. And in the first week of launch, it did 11 million hours. This show was written in Africa, produced in Africa, it's on a global network, and it did, it did 11 million hours, competing yeah. with shows that cost 10 times more made in other parts of the world. So it tells you that we can travel. So that's in my, you know, that's in my sphere. Right. And we all have to do the same thing in whatever areas yeah. we're working in, yeah. making sure it can travel. One, one sentence. One. The runway can't be too long. It's about time Africa takes off now. I think, I think we, we've been potential since independence, and I think we could remain potential for another 50 years unless we take some action and get action. things going. I think that's action. important. Action. action. Right. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for that, but I think that was a good way to end. I thank, <laughs> thank you so much thank for joining so us, much. and thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.